We talked about Inside. We did a video on it. Inside was a game that was riveting the whole way through and it was a short bite-sized experience that didn't waste any of your time. And it leads to a really unnerving kind of playful nod at bodies and differences in bodies and the ways that when you're playing a game you are embodying something else other than yourself and what that's like. And then it sort of took that to a whole nother extreme of what would it mean to be controlling something other than yourself. And Inside was such a phenomenal execution on just having the gameplay design be integrated with this overarching theme of puppetry and control. It was horrific. It executed so pristinely on that kind of horror of layers and layers of minds within minds within minds and how do you know you're you? What are you? What is the body? And what is movement within a body? What is movement in that space? And that was something really amazing. Cocoon is being advertised as from the same lead gameplay designer as Inside and Limbo. It made me think, okay, this is going to be a game where everything's going to be integrated smoothly, one piece to the next, just kind of weaving together some overarching mood and tone that's going to pay off at the end. What's been so strange about this game, and I actually think it's the thing that's making it so interesting to talk about for me, is the game has a large amount of gaps in terms of its storytelling. It's really just hinting at story here and there. The only thing that I have a solid grasp on when I start the game is this light beam comes down into some kind of monument and there is a cocoon holding what looks like a cicada type creature and it just births. And that's you. You're just playing this little winged cicada wandering through this orange mountainous landscape and you're slowly discerning how to progress forward and that's the whole of the momentum. It doesn't have direct explicit explanations of what your goal is or what your purpose is or even what the world is that you're in. But it does have narrative heft in the sense of I felt much like a newborn creature. You're just figuring out through inference what is the purpose of all of these different objects. And of course, just like any newborn creature, those objects have been settled there long before you. Really, you're trying to retrofit a system that's already in place. And you're assuming that there must be a logic to the system, otherwise it wouldn't be there. The beauty of puzzle games in particular is we know that there has to be a solution because puzzle games are not randomized. And so we have a hope that all of these inferences we're going to take is going to end in some satisfying goal. Cocoon is a game about trying to reach the outermost limits of something. You're in a world and you discover that you can get out of your world and you're looking down at the world you were just in and it's one small part of a bigger thing and then you can get out of that and there's a bigger picture still and it's just this hope that there's going to be some final big picture that you're going to reach and that to me is like the same fight for any kind of there's going to be some final answer. Because there isn't so much direct story to chew on, the whole time that I was playing Cocoon, I kept just thinking about what these mechanics illustrate or what these mechanics are doing. What is the philosophy of this? You know, what's going on in this game that is actually interesting? This game is so skeletal in its minimalist presentation of puzzle design. The objects that matter are very clearly delineated in the world that you're exploring. This seeming simplicity of how it appears and how it looks when you're wandering through the world creates a kind of purity of reaction to a lot of the things that you're seeing and experiencing. And that was very curious to me. I decided afterward to just look up information on cicadas. I found out that they're born from their eggs and they fall into the ground and they burrow underground and then go through five molt stages before they emerge out of the ground and then they're on their own. So by the time they emerge out of the ground into the world, they are fully adult. They will breed, lay more eggs, and the cycle will continue. This is an obvious thing that applies to all creatures, right? I only exist because of a cycle, a long, long spread cycle of genetic link from generation to generation. And what it makes me think about is there's a base set of instructions at the start of all living creatures. When this cicada in this game emerges from the cocoon, it isn't a blank slate. It's not just a fully absent creature that's just going to absorb everything around it. It's coming to the world with something there already. Just like a cicada emerging out of the ground knows survival without a parent having to teach it, there is so much about everything that lives that has this kind of instinct. 
what was nice about the opening of the game is we we're just jumping into the world and we're kind of running on instinct. The gameplay designer had to have it be instinct for gamers. You see like little tubes and balls going through the tubes and we know exactly what that means. We need to move the end of the tube so that the ball will go through the tube in the proper direction. And we know that switches, we just know how they work. We know what a platform is for. And all of these things we take for granted. But it's that predetermined obviousness that leads to all of the variance that makes life interesting. The ability to solve problems stems out of having that kind of root grounded starting point. Without ground, you wouldn't be able to build anything on top of it. This game opens with yourself as a cicada just inferring goals and you're kind of just slowly making your way through and the only thing you know on the outset of the game is this is a world with puzzles in it. The world itself is suggesting to me precisely where I need to head and then I'm just going to keep following that all the way through. It has this tunneling quality but it's tunneling precisely by our own motivations to be tunneled. It's fitting that this was created by the lead gameplay designer at Playdead because it feels like a game by someone who prioritized gameplay above anything else. And the tightness of that gameplay seems to be in order to make us think about the gameplay. What is the gameplay doing? What are we doing when we're just solving these puzzles? And then of course there's this big reveal down the line of what are these puzzles leading to? It's not just within the world that you've entered into. The way this game is so reticent to actually provide a hint for most of it about where these machines came from, what their purpose is, why you were born at this time and in this place. Because the game does not provide any of this context for such a long time, it has a weird way of building trust in the player that way. To me, it almost feels like if I don't know the original story reason that these machines were built, I really am just playing with machines that were built by a game designer. Rather than built by an in-fiction creator of machines, I am only playing with a game board that was created for me by a creator of games. Weirdly, the game is actually very non-confrontational compared to a game that has any story at all. There's like this inherent tension that gets created when a game has a story because it betrays the illusion that the story is trying to create. The illusion that the story creates is that these obstacles are placed in your path to thwart your progress. But without that story context, you know that the obstacles are only placed in your path as a form of education and challenge. I find myself wondering, is my reason for continuing genuinely curiosity, which it probably is, or is it more just a sense of cooperation? I want to cooperate with what is being asked of me. Is this game a negotiation between me and a lead game designer? It feels more like that because I'm not wondering if a frustrating moment is there to create a sense of frustration that puts me in the mind of a character. There's no ambiguity there, it's just like I am supposed to feel puzzled and I'm supposed to feel satisfied when I reach a solution. It's like a school more than a job. There's a playfulness and a dreamlike quality and an unseriousness in a very good way about this invitation to just play with machines that were made for the entire purpose purpose of, at least early on, just progression for progression's sake. The obstacles in this game, unlike a narrative focus game where the obstacles really are hindering your progress, the obstacles in this game are signs of progress because they are the things that are teaching you more of how to progress further. Every time you see an obstacle, you're seeing it as a lesson, this feeling of I'm guaranteed to gain something that will guarantee more progress from this. This game oddly feels like such a pure puzzle game, even though on paper it has the look and flow of a more narrative focus game in the sense that all the puzzles are integrated with each other. They're not separated by a level number with a title saying, okay, now you're going to answer this one. And it's like all boxed and separated, like in a game like Humanity or something. This one is all just everything's part of the same world and you're just kind of flowing through it. But it feels so much more like a pure puzzle game because again, it just tries to simplify itself down to the root of puzzle solving. Taking the parts you know and dabbling with what you can do with it and just getting you used to that process, embracing the gameplay of that. This is what all games are. Games are just agreements that we're making with some developers far away that, okay, you're going to arbitrarily put an obstacle and I'm agreeing that despite the fact that it's purely arbitrary and completely up to you, I'm going to pretend that it's inevitable to be this way. 
And I'm just going to embrace the feeling of inevitability of these obstacles. And there's going to be some overarching benefit to allowing that to happen. It's going to feel more than the sum of its parts. What is so compelling about this game is that it's reminding us of this puzzle design of, look, puzzles are just arbitrary constructions, and you're just trying to reverse your way back to the starting point of that construction so that you could just see how it's done and you could just move forward. But then the game reminds us that all of this is within an artificial world by having you very early on exit the artificial world that you start in. The world you're in is really one smaller world within a much bigger one. That bigger world is also a much smaller world within a much bigger world. There's this nested construct of sets. Worlds in themselves. They're supposed to be whole contained things with their own puzzle systems and their own arcs. And then you discover that it's only one smaller piece of a much, much bigger whole. As soon as I understood that this game is playing with worlds within worlds, it immediately got me thinking about, well, where are we going to end up? That was the anticipation for me. I can't wait to continue going outside of the worlds within worlds within worlds. That was a big part of my motivation. Beyond just the enjoyment of figuring out the puzzles, I just kept thinking, oh, I wonder what the world outside of this one's going to be like. They already kind of set up that expectation. That there must be something outside of that. I think what felt so satisfying about thinking that way about what's going to be outside of this whole thing is there something that felt more true about the thing that's outside of all the other worlds as if oh once I learned that this world I started out in is inside of another world there's something fake about it now that makes the outer world feel more real but of course there's nothing different about the outer world in terms of my relationship to it just knowing that it's outside has this feeling of oh there's something there there's something big it made me think a lot about the way people use language to seek for claims about things that are so big that no human could really interact with anything directly to know that claim. It gets me thinking about this desire that this game cocoon is capturing so nicely to go beyond whatever you know. That's that meta element. This game is just playing with, oh, here's something and then we're going to have a thing above that thing and then a thing above that thing. And it's like, you're just going to be thinking about the confidence of being able to look at something from far away. And we're always aiming for that kind of objective, perfectly impersonal, direct look at things. But at the end of the day, that drive to have objective, perfect outer look at what's true is a drive that's born of the fact that we don't ever relate to anything that's true without conditions. Everything that we interact with, that we learn about the world, is conditioned on what we've interacted with in the past. I have a variety of experiences, and then I extrapolate from those experiences something that's true me extrapolating that truth comes from the condition that what I had seen before was true. What I believe I know from before must be true, but that's a condition, because what if it's not? Because if that thing is not true, then everything that follows from it must also not be true. And because that's the only way we relate to anything we know is on this kind of conditional relationship of if those things that I think I know are true, therefore this other thing must be true, it makes it so tempting to have a non-conditioned statement somewhere. We just want to be able to have some premise that we can fall back on and say there's no condition for this premise. It has to be true, so then everything I know can be true. But we don't get that because we're always stuck looking from our eyes with our experiences. We want so badly to be outside of things. This game Cocoon is just going farther and farther out of these worlds. The truth is, no matter how far out you get, just like the concept of infinity, you can count to the highest number and then all you have to do is add plus one. No matter how far out you get, you just have to ask a question about that layer out. And that's what so much of this game was feeling like to me. It was just like this drive to finally get outside, further and further out of the known so that you can finally know everything. It is fascinating to me that this game about worlds within worlds ends up being quite easy. It's easy in the same way that mathematics is relatively easy compared to the problems it's solving. And in the same way that physics is relatively easy compared to what you can do with physics. When you go to an academic world and you start learning these subjects academically, what you end up learning is systems to make things easier for us to be able to accomplish things that are so much bigger than the complexity of the system we're using. Like when you and I use a computer, we're not looking at the binary code to do everything. We have that binary code translated into a far more tenable system. And then over the years, what we're pulling off with that system is just getting more and more advanced. 
And it's just this beautiful element of how you can segment information in such a way that so long as it remains integrated with the larger whole, by it being segmented, we can handle it. But what we're actually pulling off is pretty amazing. The whole game, even when the game gets fully recursive and you're looping in on the worlds and like doing layers and layers and layers, they are smart enough in their gameplay design to compartmentalize it in such a way that you could be doing something that if I told you you were going to have to do it, it would seem way too crazy and complicated. But because it is presented, segmented in a nice way, you can do it. That is a perfect example of how we can extend our limits. At bottom, if a system is formally accurate, if it's consistent, then the end point of that system can be so far away from the starting point. And all you need to be able to do is deal with the starting point. That's what No Man's Sky does, right? Like they can have an infinite universe because the code at its base is some algorithm that just consistently creates the rest of the universe. And those developers didn't have to actually hand make the universe. And how amazing that is to make a whole universe out of a small set of code that fits within gigabytes. That is a beauty of our systematic thinking. The use of the system can only be limited by whatever outer limit of the system is. And just the simple system of arithmetic has an outer limit of infinity, n plus one. Look at how beautifully simple that rule is. Any number plus one, that gives you infinity. The game being easy is a testament to the nature of you don't need something to be complicated on the ground to have complicated outcomes. And then this game ends up leading to hugely complicated outcomes. By the end of the game, it's four layers deep and you have to have them layered linearly where you're going to have only one color of world within another color and then one within that one at the deepest layer. So it becomes like an ice cream cone of worlds within worlds within worlds within worlds. But what's funny is the experience of doing that feels like the experience of just checking a box. It actually ends up being so obvious because they present it in a way that is systematically simple, but the outcome is systematically complicated and what a perfect distillation that they found by the end of cocoon this idea of these world orbs that you're collecting will contain other world orbs and then those worlds will contain worlds it's this kind of pointing at itself the world will have itself you start to be able to stack the worlds into each other in such a way that you can have the world you're in contain itself the way that you were before entering in and out of the worlds is through these little launch pads that will take you in and out. And those are very clean in the sense that the puzzle doesn't get too complicated. There's only one exit and one entrance. But what happens is at some point you find additional kinds of exits and entrances into the worlds inside of the worlds. So you will find a doorway that instead of leaping you out of a world into the bigger world, the doorway just takes you to the other world. And that's inside of the world. So then you can leap out and have this double world inside of any one world. And then you can use the doorway to kind of enter in and out and loop in on yourself. The game had to lead to this point of looping in on itself. Recursion is something that we use all of the time. Our language is a recursive language. We have a limited set of words. And yet the ideas we can create out of those words is infinite. The reason that that can be the case, the reason why the sentence I'm saying right now has probably never been said before is because our sentences are perfectly recursive. We could constantly be building off of it using the same words, but in a different context and then it has new meaning. A very simple example is this sentence is a long sentence that says this sentence is a long sentence that says this sentence is a long sentence that says and it can go on forever. The thing that's so great about recursion is the only thing that's happening in that sentence is it's referring back to itself. This sentence is a long sentence that says, and you would think, well, there's nothing new coming out of that, right? However, what's fascinating is as soon as I gave that example of this sentence is a long sentence that says, this sentence is a long sentence that says, it has new meaning because it's been used as an example of recursion. Use of recursion is actually what allows for new information to emerge out of limited information. This is what we do for ourselves focus on what you attend to in your moment of just sitting in your chair and you're watching this video and you're seeing the keyboard in front of you and your mouse and your hands and you can sense a kind of outer boundary of your vision. You can hear my voice in your speakers. Focus on the you in that. Out of your eyes and in the sound that's coming in is a whole world of objects around you. We're just directly engaging with a wide variety of objects. 
as you engage with objects, you start to signify these objects as being important, as being things separate from you. Oh, I can grab this thing and my grabbing of it guarantees it's different than me. As soon as you think of it as different than the thing that's grabbing it, you've made yourself an object in the world just like the object that you just interacted with. The only ability for you to have a sense of self comes from recursively thinking about the thing that's doing the thinking as something separate than the thing doing the thinking. It has to refer to itself to create a notion of self. And this comes from Douglas Hofstadter in his book, Godel, Escher, and Bach, where he kind of explains the notion of Godel's incompleteness theorem and the way that logic kind of circles in on itself. But he uses this as a way to illustrate the strange loop of personhood, which that loop is just seeing the persons around you. You see your parents, you see your family, you see everyone around you. And then all of this is interacting with something. But the moment you define that something, you've just objectified it and put it outside of the thing defining it. It's almost like there's a shape forming around it of all the things interacting with it. And so it's really an absence. You've delineated it by all the things it's not. Recursion allows you to create new information. And so we do that with a sense of self. We do that with language. This is something that's always a part of our lives. It's just this recursive process. And this recursive process is something that we yearn to escape from. I was reading about the rationalist Leibniz. He had this idea of the only thing that we could know for certain is what is prior to experience because we can't rely on our experience. Our experience is subjective. He thought, okay, the way that I'll find objective truth is to just think what is logically necessary. And if I can come up with what's logically necessary, then that will give me truth. And then Hume came along and he was the empiricist who said everything is from our experience and therefore we know nothing other than experience. And then Kant came along he kind of agreed, but he was a stickler for science. He thought science is going to be the way forward. There has to be something more than just the lack of confidence that Hume had. Because Hume had this idea that you can't really know anything past experience, and experience is barely known. His famous point was that we don't really know cause and effect. We have a series of examples, many, many examples of cause and effect. That doesn't mean that cause and effect is guaranteed to be true. And that was Hume's whole thing. And then Kant came along, his point was that the very act of experiencing at all, any kind of experiencer, has to have something prior to the experience that allows for experience itself to exist. And he found that the thing that has to be prior to experience is space and time. The reason he says that, if there's any experiencer, the very definition of experience something is something outside of yourself. That's space. And then if there's any processing of experience that has to occur through time. And then from those, you could infer synthetic a priori, which are things that you know before you experience them because you are an experiencer. And those are things like the very nature of having time means that cause and effect has to exist because how else do you determine time if not through cause and effect? He was trying to find a way to have some kind of guarantees. Then Kant, funny person that he is, even though his whole goal was to make science grounded and solid, he actually ended up putting a huge limit on what science actually is and what knowledge can actually be. We only know things as phenomena, as things experienced. We do not know things of themselves. And he doesn't say that there is things of themselves. That would actually be slightly contradictory for him to be able to say there is noumena, there's things of themselves. It gets away from Hume's limitations on a priori by saying that just by experiencing there are things that we know for certain, but these things are only known for certain so long as we're experiencing. We're always locked in ourselves. We never get fully outside. This game Cocoon is like the same exact thing. We're getting outside again and again and again. And by the end of the game, it really just goes as far outside as it could. And you have see the worlds within worlds within worlds within worlds. And then there's this weird kind of galaxy of all the worlds wrapping around. And then at the very last moment, it goes outside of all that again. As if to say that all of that stuff made you feel as if you finally got the very end of all these truths where all the pieces fit together perfectly. And just like any formal system fits together perfectly, the game reminds us there can still be something outside of it. It's fun to play a game or to see a game that's actually messing with what are the conundrums that arise when you're dealing with recursion within space. The conundrum is hopelessness. You're not going to get the guarantee. You're not going to get an answer. You feel like you're at the most outside of everything and it looks like everything is perfectly integrated on itself and then it zooms out one more time. No, you can self-reference that too. That thing could also be in a loop. It doesn't mean that it's not progressing. By recurring, you're learning something new. 
And the most simple example in the gameplay itself is as you progress outside of the orbs, the context of the inner orb changes. The meaning of that inner orb is now different because now that orb has a use that it didn't have when you were in it. Becoming self-aware is useful for getting new information. And then you can use the thing that you used to be inside of as a means of getting even further out. And then when you get further out, there's now more self-reference and then that creates more meaning. And so long as the chain continues, which is purely a chain of self-motivation and effort, again, the same instinctual self-motivation we talked about at the beginning of the game where you just pop out into the world and you just have to decide for yourself that you want to be in this seemingly endless process of puzzle solving, that process is going somewhere. It's just not going to an end point. It's rather just going and going and going. Maybe that's all that matters. It's a good instinct to get a broader view and to get outside of what we know, but it's just probably inaccurate to call it outside. There seems to be a lot of evidence throughout human history of human beings being very uniquely and consistently able to puzzle out information that they simply were not given. One pretty dramatic example being how much pure math resulted in Einstein's theories of general relativity and special relativity, which then were confirmed in ways that he couldn't have confirmed at the time through anything other than conjecture. Something so precise that it functioned as evidence despite the fact that it was concretely not evident and unconfirmed officially at the time. That kind of thing seems to me like the end game of the value of intelligence. I do not believe that there's any specific reason to imagine that there could ever be a more intelligent type of being than that. We may not be as mentally fast as is possible. We may not have acute senses. We may not have the best equipment to learn information, but by having access to math and logic and these things, we actually do have everything we need to learn everything that there is to know. Because it has proven so effective in teaching us information that was not actually provided. I think puzzle solving is exactly what enables us to be more than just experiencers. When we have an ability to see limited information and almost immediately and potentially very rigorously infer more information, that's the light speed travel of thought. That's the fastest way to find out anything. Experiencing is what we do. Experiencing is a big part of it. Without experience, we can't have any facts to draw from. But once we have drawn from some facts, we can learn so much just by puzzle solving. Puzzle solving is like an underrated source of evidence in a way, because not only does it allow you to gain new evidence, but it allows you to even decide whether something is evidence. It is our ability to logically puzzle things out that not only enables us to see more, but to also deny what we see in an intelligent way. To experience something and say, well, that felt a certain way, but actually I know that that feeling and that perception was totally wrong. And I'm going to deny my perception, not because I'm in denial, but because I, I just simply know logically that it would actually make more sense for what I saw to not be true. That's so much more powerful than just being an experiencer and a perceiver. Under hypotheticals, we can ride those hypotheticals toward truths that are true outside of them, because if it's true, we will hit some kind of limit, and that does give us something to look outside of. If it's possible, then by the act of recursion, the very thing that we've been talking about and the very thing that this game illustrates so fantastically, we can improve whatever limit we have. So if it's possible to know something and still be a physical experiencer, then all knowledge becomes a matter of time, which is why it is so important for us to keep trying to know more. To the degree we can discover our limits, that means we can discover more than our limits. We are looking outside of ourselves. And that is something that this game cocoon is just sort of doing the whole way through. Thanks for watching the whole video. If you feel a little disappointed that we didn't directly offer a story explanation or interpretation of cocoon, there are two great videos that we think you would enjoy checking out. There's one by the YouTuber Deadforge, who's actually a friend of mine and helped me uh, think about this video as I was creating it. And he has a wonderful video called Cocoon and Audiovisual Design, in which he breaks down some of the implications of the story based on how the audio and visuals integrate into an overarching, potentially horrifying interpretation of what's really going on in the story. 
And then there is this wonderful direct explanation of the ending of the game by Pixel Pondering, in which she slowly and carefully goes through each of the images in the game and tries to very directly decipher a story from Cocoon. We're just going to directly link to these two videos in the description or in a pinned comment so that you can watch it yourself and get that satisfaction of a more direct interpretation. Our video is more of branching off of what we feel the game illustrates in a far more philosophical direction. But if you're just seeking that story analysis directly into Cocoon, we think those two videos will serve you well. Thank you for watching. We appreciate it. We know that the video meanders in all sorts of unusual directions, but if you've been watching this channel for a while, that should be to be expected, right? We hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll see you next time on To Games It May Concern.